happened to the university or the undergraduate institution of higher education? I mean, after all, everybody has a complaint about going to college. And usually these lamentations revolve around three general areas. Number one, college is too expensive. Number two, it cannot turn out a literate graduate. And number three, it is politically biased, or at least it's partisan to such a degree that the old idea of disinterested learning doesn't apply anymore. In fact, all three are valid, valid criticisms of the university. Let's go back and, and examine them one by one. The university today costs, if it's a private liberal arts institution, about $50,000, 55, even 60 for room, board, and tuition. If one were to go to a public university, the California State University System, or perhaps the University of California System, University of Texas, University of Michigan, that cost might be 20 to 30,000. I say that cost for the consumer is what I mean because the state taxpayer will make up the, the difference. Why is the university or the college so expensive today? There's a lot of reasons. Tuition goes up higher each year than does the rate of inflation because, let's fill in the blanks, we have a smaller teaching load than we ever had. A professor used to teach four classes a semester, maybe eight a year, even nine, ten a year. Today they might do two and two in a semester system. The university is asked to do things it never used to do, and that can range everything from having a center for migrant education or a center for disabled students or a rock climbing wall in its student union. Those were not part of the university experience before. There used to be a system of scholarship that said, we will promote you based on your classroom effectiveness and the degree to which you write a book that people might want to read. Today, a academic superstar could cost $175,000, $250,000 in the liberal arts and no one knows who he or she is in the general population, and they may write a cutting-edge article on literary criticism or philosophy that has a readership of 20 people, and yet the university had to subsidize 1,000, 2,000 hours of research by taking that professor out of the classroom and hiring part-time teachers. So we have this anomaly that 40, 50 percent of the units in some public institutions are outsourced to part-time employees that work by the hour to subsidize a grandee class that is doing very little teaching, but the university feels that it must hire them. So college is too costly. It's also not turning out literate graduates. If in 1960 a person graduated and he went to work as a supervisor, say at the Department of Motor Vehicles, you could depend that he could write well, she could turn in a memo without misspelled words, she could express herself rationally with a vocabulary larger than a thousand words, and she would have a general knowledge of what the First Amendment was, who George Washington was, what the Battle of Gettysburg was. They had the furniture, in other words, of a learned and educated person after four years of college education. That's no longer the case. Not only is the university expensive, but it cannot guarantee society in general and the employer in particular that its product, and that's what we're talking about, products are literate and broadly educated individuals. What went wrong there? And the answer is, again, the university was asked to do things that it never had been asked before. Under the old system, if a person wanted to be an accountant, if a person wanted uh, to be a physical education expert or a personal trainer, they did one of two things. They went to a union or a business and they apprenticed on the job and learned those skills. That was one way we, we handled the trades, so to speak. Today, those are incorporated within universities, of course not private liberal arts colleges, but large public universities. So we, we have trade, skills being taken over by colleges where they used to belong to the private sector. And, and therefore, we can't have as many classes in English literature or English prose composition or geometry. So too, there were social science, isms and ologies. By the 1950s and 60s, there were things that had never been in the university curriculum before. Sociology, anthropology, community studies. And then we added, in the last 30 years, environmental studies. In fact, let's just stop this pretense 
of going through them and say any course that has the word studies on it, environmental studies, women's studies, black studies, gay studies, peace studies, all of these courses in the past were considered elements, subsets, chapters within philosophy, history, or literature. Suddenly the university said, you know what? The social sciences will be part of the general curriculum. The problem with these courses were advocacy courses. They taught people not to explore geology, but to find out how global warming had destroyed the planet, and this is what you're going to read, and this is how you're going to read it, and this is what way of thinking you're going to come to. And so, in other words, the university changed its curriculum, and it no longer taught or was no longer responsible for the type of traditional education that had guaranteed a student would leave after four years and be a quote unquote literate member of society. So that's a bad combination for a college or university to A, not be able to guarantee that its product, i.e. the student who's getting a baccalaureate degree is educated as promised, and B, increasing the cost of that uh, dubious product in the process. But there was a third critique against the university as well. It's not just that it's too expensive and it's not fulfilling its pledge to send out to society enlightened and educated graduates, but that it's partisan. Well, a country is roughly 50 per 50 percent divided between left and right, or you can say it's more conservative than more liberal. But if you were to look at colleges and universities, it seems to be way out of whack, way more liberal. What criteria do you have to adjudicate that? Well, Look at faculty senate votes, 95 to 1 in favor of gay marriage. Academic senates will weigh in on that topic, and they'll weigh in in ways that are disproportionate. They don't make any sense. Oppose the war in Iraq, 150 to 5. And what these are are reflections that the faculty is not diverse. Or you can have surveys of campaign donations by law school faculty or by political science, or by the undergraduate institution at large, of a political persuasion that is either not typical of America at large, we could live with that, but is so far atypical that the students may not get a, uh, a clearly ba fair and balanced, so to speak, education. Now you should say, well, what does one's politics have to do with mathematics or geology? Well, maybe the political differences do not uh, arise in the hard sciences or mathematics, but when we get to courses such as political science or history or literature, and we start talking about writers that may or may not have been gay in antiquity, Plato, or we talk about wars like the Civil War, or we talk about the dropping of the bomb in Hiroshima, then we have politics enter the equation. Let me give you one or two examples. If we were to study World War II, that period from September of 1939 until August of 1945, you could see that there would be a lot of issues involved. There would be geo-strategy, why Hitler decided to invade the Soviet Union, why Japan started an attack on Pearl Harbor. There would be economic issues, what made Japan think that it was resource poor. There would be political issues, how to get a communist Soviet Union as a part of a liberal democratic alliance. There would be cultural issues. Why are Japan and Germany exercising military authority inordinate maybe to their population size or their territory or their natural resources? These would be legitimate topics. And then of course popular culture, you could talk about Rosie the Riveter and you could talk about the Japanese internment. However, if you go to a standard university uh, curriculum and you look at its courses, you may find out that labor politics of the 1930s or feminism in the 1960s are much more popular and, and offered much more frequently than World War II, the singular most important event in the 20th century. And if you were to look at World War II, you would see an inordinate amount, I say inordinate amount, because you would really be studying about four or five events. The culpability of America dropping the atomic bomb, the unappreciated Tuskegee Airmen flying in Italy, the heroic efforts of feminism and Rosie the Riveter, places like Willow Run in Michigan building planes or building bombs. And you would not have much knowledge about Okinawa, or Iwo Jima, George Patton, Dwight Eisenhower. So when we get a graduate out of the politicized university and he or she is in the workplace and 
somebody says to them, what do you think of World War II? And should we have joined at this particular point in World War II? Should we have sat out 1940? Why did France collapse so precipitously in spring of 1940? Why did Japan keep on fighting in August in Manchuria? They have not a clue. They don't know. Mention, do you think we should have dropped the bomb? And of course, you'll get a long uh, reasoning why we should not have. So that politicalization affected the curriculum. It affected the conduct of the university. And along with its steeper cost and its inability to fulfill its mission of turning out learned literate graduates, what was it, the college supposed to be? I mean, why do I say it's changed? Because I must have some archetype. And we can go back to the 1920s, 30s, 40s, 50s, or even the early 60s. And we know kind of what, what college was. It was a unique phenomenon of American society. It said, I'm going to take people for about four years of their life. Now, this is really a radical step because they're not going to be in the workplace. Society is going to have to eat that cost. You're taking able 18 to 21-year-olds who could be fighting in the military. They could be building steel. They could be doing all these very valuable things, but we're going to take them out, millions of them, out of the workforce. And we're going to gamble that we can educate them to such a degree that when we put them back in the workforce, they will increase productivity. They will increase the level of our civilization. They will culturally enrich America. That was the idea. And not everybody's going to go to college. As I said, there's going to be trade schools, there's going to be union apprenticeships, there's going to be learning on the job, etc. But for those who go, we are really going to insist that they can read great literature. They're going to know who Milton is, they're going to know analytic geometry, they're going to know something about the Franco-Prussian War. And they're going to be well-rounded individuals. And the people who are going to teach them or going to be professors are kind of strange, or whatever eccentricity we associate in a stereotypical fashion with faculty, that's what they're going to be, because you see, they're going to have an unreal existence. They're going to live in a very beautiful place, beautiful campus, be given lifetime employment with tenure that nobody else gets. They're only going to have to work 30 weeks a year, their entire summer's off. It's a very good existence. We're not going to pay them that great, but they're going to be given titles, doctor, professor, so in exchange for that part of the bargain, they're going to do what we need them to do, turn out disinterested, apolitical, highly educated, highly uh, competent graduates. And that is what college used to be. And again, what we did was we said that's not fair that the faculty don't participate in the mainstream of American politics, especially after the Vietnam War. We're going to say, you know what, America's biased, the family, the corporation, the religion, they're all conservative. All we have is Hollywood, the, a few foundations in the press. We need the university. We can't be biased because we're the counterweight to the proponents of American values and culture and politics. So we politicized the university, and then we said, you know what? We're going to teach people how to do things and teach people how to think things and let everybody in. And the result of it is today, the university is a brand. It's like I have a BA from UC Santa Barbara. That does not mean that I am politically disinterested, that I look at the world empirically, that I can read very well. It does not mean I can give you a little talk about Teddy Roosevelt. It just means that I have a brand and you should hire me. I can take any classic student and put them in Hillsdale College for four years and I guarantee you they will be a better educated person than Stanford Classics graduate. I can take any English major and put them at St. Thomas Aquinas and they will turn out far better educated in Princeton. But I would not advocate that for people whose students can get into Princeton or Stanford or Harvard and have the money to pay for it because the brand is bigger. And that's what the university has become today. You pay fifty-five, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 to a private liberal arts institution. You send your child there. You don't really worry whether they're educated. You know that society will honor that certificate, that brand, give them a better job. They will meet people of a like class, upper income. It's an investment that you hope that they marry well. They ensure their slot in the upper middle class. And that's what the university is today. Where are we going? This is an unsustainable enterprise. It's too expensive, it's too political, and it doesn't fulfill its mission. So what we're going to see is a unraveling of the last 30 years. We're already seeing it happen. Most colleges, the idea of a full professor making $150,000 teaching two classes a year, writing esoteric academic publications is ending. 
Why not just have a person who can come in, teach a class, get in a car, drive to another, an exploited hell out, in other words. And you know what the funny thing is? There's no criterion that we know of that says a part-time teacher is a worse classroom performer than a full professor. So society is questioning the entire expense of the whole academic traditional enterprise. And the result is, on the one hand, we're getting trade schools that say to us, you know what, you're not really teaching liberal arts anymore. You're really not teaching appreciation of Shakespeare. You're not teaching people to reason and write well, so we're not going to do it either. In fact, we're going to just issue computer literacy degrees, we're going to issue things about how to be physical therapists, and we're going to just get away with the whole pretense. And then some others are saying, you know what? If the university's not doing its job and it's charging $50,000, we'll do something even better. We'll have a national test to guarantee that potential workers will be literate and be educated, we'll have a national test and we'll administer it. And you say, well, all the graduates will pass it. No, they won't. Some person is 18, he wants to go to the military for four years, he studies at night, and he says, you know what, I can read, and I can write, and I can think better than somebody who spent $200,000 at Stanford University, because I scored higher on this test, and therefore you should hire me and not him. And finally, we're getting to a virtual university where people are saying, we don't have the capital, so what we're basically going to do is going to put it online. We won't even have a trade school, anybody who wants to get videos of the great professors in the world, and we can do the whole process for a quarter, a third of the cost. In conclusion, are we losing something? Yes, because the old idea of the university was a unique investment. You cannot replace the classroom interaction between the professor and the student. You cannot replace the idea that students go and they meet various students of all different political persuasions, racial backgrounds, class backgrounds. You cannot erase the experience of being told again and again, think whatever you want. If you're a fascist, if you're a communist, a conservative, liberal, that's great. We're, we've lost all that and we won't be able to replace it. Mm -hmm.